Okay, uh, this is our, what I like to call our WENK lecture, what every neuropath, WENK, <laughs> what every neuropathologist needs to know. And I'm super thrilled to uh, introduce a dear colleague, another dear colleague. How lucky are we, right? This is uh, Dr. Isaac Solomon. Let me focus here for a second. And he is going to give us an update on neuro uh, ID workups and consultation resources, which I know we all are um, dying to hear about. He's an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School, neuropathologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he also serves as an associate medical director of the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory, the associate program director of the Franz von Lichtenberg Infectious Disease and Molecular Microbiology Fellowship, of which he was the first incumbent and graduate. No, he was the second, after Dan Milner, who's talking tomorrow. Uh, prior to his current position, he graduated from the Medical Scientist Training Program at Wash U in St. Louis with a doctoral dissertation on prion pathogenesis, and then completed Anatomic Path Residency, Medical Microbiology Fellowship, and Neuropath Fellowship uh, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and the joint program with Boston Children's Hospital. His primary research interests are centered on the diagnosis and pathogenesis of CNS viral infections, including uh, SARS-CoV-2, HIV, and arbovirus encephalitis. And he currently serves as the president of the Binford Dammon Society of Infectious Disease Pathologists and has recently published the third edition of Diagnostic Pathology, Infectious Diseases. So Isaac, please enlighten us. Thank you uh, for the invitation to, to speak. Uh, I'm very honored and very humbled and very terrified. Uh, so if I start talking too quickly, uh, you'll know that I'm getting extra nervous. Um, so diagnostic, uh, diagnosing infections is, I think, a, a critical area of neuropathology um, that people are maybe not as comfortable with in neuropathology uh, who haven't done CP training. A lot of people do the APNP track and completely skip over their time in the micro lab. Uh, and so might not be as familiar with all the tools that are available to, to make these diagnoses, uh, which are probably even more time critical than correctly diagnosing a tumor since hours to days can make a huge difference uh, in a patient's outcome. So trying to give you some tools to uh, not waste time and ideally not let HemePath uh, steal your case for two weeks. So I have no uh, relevant financial uh, relationships to disclose. Here are the learning objectives. Uh, so I've, um, from my training with Dan Milner, have really um, focused on a, sort of a layered uh, diagnostic um, paradigm similar to what we do for CNS tumors, uh, where we have a morphologic description of what's going on, and then we integrate all the other available data, whether it's molecular cultures uh, and so on. Uh, so for the learning objectives, we want to be able to generate an infectious differential uh, based on the inflammatory patterns and clinical history, uh, select an appropriate initial battery of stains, and then any other ancillary testing molecular assays to uh, confirm that etiology and then integrate everything at the end. So just to take a step back uh, before you get to neuropathology, how do we diagnose CNS infections? You really have to start with uh, clinical history. Uh, this is the classic situation where you send the medical student in and talk to the patient for an hour and you find out what kind of cheeses they eat, where they've been, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, then you have some radiology and they might have a focal lesion or a diffuse lesion and that can uh, help uh, narrow your differential. And then you, you do basically everything you can do not to have to sample the brain tissue. So there's a lot of blood testing, serology, cultures uh, that can sometimes get you an answer. Uh, the next step up uh, in escalation is CSF. And then finally you get to brain tissue, which uh, sometimes is uh, a result of neurology asking for a brain biopsy. Sometimes it's because the patient needs uh, relief of intracranial pressure. And sometimes it's because the patient came to autopsy. 
so as you all know, we have a variety of tools available to us as neuropathologists, uh, gross examination, frozen sections, routine h &Es, special stains, which I know some of you uh, may not like looking at as much as I do. Uh, but that's the most important step is to look at the stains after you order them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I've gotten consulted for weird stuff on a GMS stain, and I said, well, you missed all the acid fast bacilli, which you, you might want to look at. Um, immunistic chemistry uh, is useful in a lot of situations. Uh, in situ hybridization, especially when you can make your own probes with RNA scope now, is becoming um, increasingly useful. Electron microscopy is not as useful uh, as it has been in the past, but can be helpful if there's a new emerging viral infection that people aren't uh, familiar with. Uh, molecular testing, and then your friendly ID pathology consults like myself. Uh, so we're just going to go through a bunch of cases, and if you looked ahead, you might already know the answers, but pretend you don't. Um, so this is the first case, a 73-year-old man with a history of uh, a lot of stuff, um, and he was admitted with subacute uh, uh, changes in acute mental status. Uh, and was found on imaging to have this nodular uh, heterogeneously enhancing lesion in the left insula. Um, and, you know, sometimes when I give these talks, I am more negative about the radiologist completely missing the fact that they have an in infection, but this one they actually put the infection in the differential, so I want to give them credit for that. Um, but, of course, this was to diagnose a glioma, not for an infection. But anyway. Um, we, this is the tissue we got in the biopsy, and in the top left, you can see some necroinflammatory uh, uh, tissue. Uh, in the top right, you can see lots of filamentous structures on a GMS stain that are small and thin. Uh, on the bottom left, you can see uh, some weakly gram-positive staining, if you are willing to give me the benefit of the doubt. Our tissue gram stain isn't the best stain in the world, and for this particular entity, it's even uh, worse, uh, in my opinion. But anytime you see any gram positivity, I think you should call it positive. Uh, and then in the bottom right, we, uh, we see a little bit of staining on a modified acid fast stain. So this is a classic case of nocardia. And uh, this is something that you can get to a, def a definitive diagnosis just on the histology. Um, so after hopefully not too many days of uh, thinking about which stains you want to order and looking at them, you can get a definitive diagnosis to the team and they can treat the patients. Um, two to four weeks later, this was positive in culture and the species was determined to be nocardia purus by 16S sequencing. Uh, but if this had been a more recent case, it would have just been t determined by mass spec once the culture was positive. Uh, so this is the general approach uh, we take. Uh, if you're suspicious for bacterial infection, you want to look at the inflammatory pattern. So if you see something that looks like a meningitis, a cerebritis, an abscess, uh, if you see any uh, granulomatous inflammation, any plasma cells, these are all hints that you're looking at some sort of bacteria. You could be looking at some sort of a bacterial infection. So we've, uh, in our experience, decided that it's better just to order all the stains for this differential up at, at once. Uh, so we order a gram, a GMS, and a modified acid fast stain uh, in all cases uh, where we see these uh, histologic findings. Uh, sometimes you can see bacteria, but and it can vary from eosinophilic to basophilic, uh, and it's, it's sort of hard to know um, what the species is without further uh, staining. Um, for some organisms, uh, if we're really suspicious for a bacterial infection, we'll do a Worth and Starry stain, but that gets to be a little treacherous in the brain uh, because axons also like to stain with the Worth and Starry stain. Uh, and that's a very, very painful thing to look at if you have a large section. Um, if you're thinking about syphilis, you should do a spirochete stain. Anytime you see plasma cells, just do the stain. Um, and so then once you have all of that data, we report it morphologically and then look at the culture results. We always have our fellows and residents look up the culture results, say whether they think the culture results match the histology, you know, the, the, the integrated diagnosis. Uh, and then if we still don't have an answer, then we'll do 16S sequencing or other molecular testing. Uh, so if you're not familiar with 16S sequencing, it's the, uh, the rRNA from the small ribosomal subunit uh, in bacteria. It's about a 1,500 base pair gene, and the first uh, couple hundred base pairs are usually enough to sequence um, and figure out what bacterial species you're dealing with, or at least the genus. Uh, there's other targets you can use, uh, especially if you're interested in mycobacteria, like the heat shock protein 65 or RPOB. Uh, and then if you're trying to distinguish between MTB and other mycobacteria, sometimes the, the uh, IS6110 
uh, repeat element can be useful, but it's not uh, always available everywhere. Uh, so you can look at this in the slides afterwards. This is just the overall general approach that I use um, in trying to figure out how the best way to diagnose different groups of bacteria. So you have your gram positives, and in almost all cases, the best stain for that's going to be a gram stain. You know, uh, and unless it's an acid fast bacillus, and then you'll need an AFB stain. Uh, for the gram negatives, those are definitely much trickier. You almost never see them very well with a tissue gram stain. So, Worth and Star or Steiner is uh, is your next best bet for those. Uh, spirochetes, again, you're going to need an immunostain, and then the other stuff um, that's intracellular, like mycoplasma, you're going to need IHC, which is generally only available uh, at reference centers like the CDC. So moving on, uh, our second case is a 76-year-old uh, with a history of renal transplant uh, who presented with left facial pain uh, and then was found to have these multiple ring-enhancing lesions up to one and a half centimeters, and you can see that uh, on the bottom left of the image. Uh, so in this case, uh, in the top left, you can see, again, some abscess tissue with reactive brain. Below that, uh, you can see a few small round structures that aren't really staining with anything, so we uh, usually refer that as negative staining. Uh, it's highlighted very nicely on the GMS stain, and then we've confirmed that it's cryptococcus with our Musicarmin stain uh, here, and with the Fontana Masson stain, uh, it stains the pigment uh, and can sometimes help us with these cases. So that was uh, cryptococcal brain abscess. Probably doesn't explain the patient's uh, facial pain, but. Uh, We'll just pretend it does. Um, interestingly, despite all the crypto that we saw in this patient's brain, uh, the cultures from the same operation that were sent by the surgeon at the exact same time never grew in culture. Uh, the 1,3-beta-D-glucan, that's the cell wall marker, uh, was never positive uh, in the CSF, and the cryptococcal antigen was negative. So it seems to be very uh, well uh, walled off within this patient's brain. Uh, the next case uh, is a 51-year-old uh, with relapsed AML, uh, status post to bone marrow transplant. Uh, and I've showed uh, both the, the CT and the MRI because the CT, I think, is a little more dramatic. Um, and it shows up to 2.4 centimeters of ring-enhancing lesions. Um, and the, the radiologist got this one right. Uh, so you can see very faintly on this h and &E stain, um, some filamentous fungal elements, which are much better highlighted on the GMS stain. Uh, so the key thing, if you see filamentous fungi, is to distinguish between mucoralis and everything else, um, because that's an immediate treatment difference for the patients. Um, and we'll go a little bit more into how to further differentiate from there. Uh, but for these, uh, because it didn't look like a mucoralis, it looked narrow with septations and maybe some acute angle branching, uh, we just called it a fungal abscess with uh, hyphal forms. Uh, in culture, this actually turned out to be Sporium apiospermum, uh, which is usually bad news in immunosuppressed patients. Uh, they tend to do very poorly. Um, this also will be positive by 1,3-beta-D-glucan, um, like many other fungi, uh, but it'll be negative for galactomannan, which can help you distinguish it from aspergillus. Uh, so this is our overall approach to fungal infections. You look, again, at the inflammatory pattern. Uh, you can almost always, but not always, uh, see fungi on an HDE stain if you look carefully. Um, but there's always more when you look um, on the silver stain or the PASD, if whichever is your favorite stain. I usually end up ordering both because there's some organisms that, for whatever reason, work better or worse with one stain. And again, you want to get this done sooner rather than later, so I'm in favor of just ordering both. Uh, there's some confirmatory stains that can be helpful in certain situations, uh, like Fontana Masson and Musicarmin for uh, cryptococcus and Gram stains for Canada. Um, there are IHC and ish stains available, but the, they're non-specific enough um, just because of the common components of the, the cell walls that they're not super reliable, um, but they, they are used. Um, and again, report all your um, histologic data, integrate with the molecular, and we'll talk a, a bit about that in a second. Uh, so this is just a little pop quiz. Uh, these are six different fungal infections, and if you can tell me what all six of these are and you haven't peeked at the slide ahead, uh, then I'll tell Dr. Deidre Lomi to buy you some pistachio ice cream next time you're in Boston, um, which I never earned as a fellow ever. Um, but 
it's true. Um, that the top one, it, you know, looks a little bit different. This one has is broad ribbony with 90 degree angle branching. So if you got to a mucoralis, you'd you'd be in the right ballpark. Uh, the next one over is thin filamentous hyphae with acute angle branching, uh, and that's an asper it looks good for an aspergillus, and if you had your galactomannan, you'd be pretty comfortable calling that, uh, or I'd be pretty comfortable calling it. Uh, the other ones all look very similar. They have narrow hyphae with septations, uh, could be confused with aspergillus. Uh, so uh, there are actually a variety of different things. So we have fusarium uh, in the top right. We have sketosporium which I just showed you on the bottom left. Uh, we actually have Canada, which uh, usually shows up as a mix of pseudo hyphae uh, and yeast, but in this case also forms true hyphae. And uh, if you got the bottom one on the right, Rigidoporus uh, corticola, you'd be uh, much better at my job than I am. Uh, it's, it's like a plant fungus for peaches. Uh, you don't want that. All right, ancillary testing for fungus. Uh, as I've mentioned a few times, you have serologic testing. Uh, that can be from blood or CSF. Uh, and there's a few different antigens you can test for, for um, a lot of the dimorphic fungi, but they cross-react a little, so you have to be careful in not believing those as ground truth. You, you do have to correlate, again, with the morphology. Um, and then these fungal wall components, uh, you can see the diagram in the top right, uh, which shows you, you know, where galactomannan is and where 1,3-beta-deglucan uh, is. Um, and those are the, the two most popular ones. Uh, there are some things like IVIG will give you a false positive for 1,3-beta-deglucan uh, just because of uh, how they make the solution. So if you have something that's off, uh, off the scale, um, you, you don't want to commit to it being a fungus if it's really just um, a false positive. Uh, and then for molecular, uh, there are some targeted PCRs. Um, there's certain commercially available panels that I'm not allowed to talk about um, that include these in the panel, and if you want to use those, that's great. Um, and then you can also use broad spectrum sequencing. And for fungus, in contrast to bacteria, we tend to focus on the large ribosomal subunits. Uh, the uh, so it's called the D1, D2 region of this 28 sRNA gene, uh, which is over here. Uh, and that's good for a majority of uh, clinically relevant fungal infections. And then there's also this internal transcribed spacer region which surrounds the, the 5.8S rRNA, and that also, for whatever reason, has been very helpful phylogenetically in classifying fungus. So we use that more than 18S, but some people still like to say they're going to do 18S sequencing, even though nobody does that. Um, and this is the overview of how we classify fungus, um, uh, whether it's broad ribbony, whether it's pigmented, uh, and, and so forth. And I've already talked about most of this, and we'll move on for the sake of time. Uh, and then yeast is, uh, and all these slides should be available online if you want to look at them in, in more detail. Uh, for yeast, again, we focus on size and uh, budding patterns, and that gets us uh, to where we need to go most of the time. There's few things that truly overlap if you uh, to, are, are very uh, careful about how you look at those two things. All right, moving on to case number four. Uh, we have a 70-year-old uh, who has lots of uh, bad stuff in his history, um, presented with altered mental status after an unwitnessed fall, uh, two witness seizures, had some white blood cells in his CSF. Uh, and you can probably make the diagnosis just by looking at it. Um, um, where you have this uh, hyperintensity in uh, unilateral temporal lobe. Uh, so uh, this patient unfortunately went to autopsy, and you can see uh, nicely that this correlates with the radiology. Uh, we see uh, leptomeningitis and encephalitis and perivascular inflammation and tons of uh, positive cells on our HSV immunostain. So this was uh, a textbook case of HSV1 uh, meningoencephalitis. So this one, um, no, no, no challenges in the next case, um, is a, a little bit of, of a greater challenge um, where we had a 56-year-old with mantle cell lymphoma on rituximab, my favorite uh, therapeutic agent, uh, and presented with rapidly progressing dementia of unknown etiology. They actually thought this patient might have had CJD, so they admitted him for an expedited workup. Um, and uh, eventually um, found nothing. Uh, and unfortunately, the patient passed away, came to autopsy, 
And you can see the brain in here looks relatively normal, but all throughout the brain we saw evidence of meningoencephalitis, lots of lymphocytes, and uh, microglia, and microglial nodules, and so forth. Uh, so our fellow, our former fellow, Shannon Coy, actually presented this a few years ago at the DSS, and this turned out to be a case of Jamestown Canyon encephalitis that was diagnosed by CSF uh, Metagenomics, done by UCSF. Uh, and then we did a few other uh, tests to try to confirm that because uh, there, been, there had been no autopsies reported with this virus ever um, and no fatal cases uh, ever before this one that we were aware of. Uh, so we were a little skeptical. Um, so that was the metagenomics result. Usually these cases are diagnosed by serology, um, but in this case uh, the serology was negative, we think, because of the rituximab. Um, but we were able to confirm the metagenomics by uh, PCR and the serum of the brain tissue, and then we designed some RNA scope uh, ish probes and confirmed that there are uh, cells in the brain that have this uh, virus. All right, so our general approach to CNS viruses uh, is to look for a pattern that's suspicious uh, with encephalitis. Um, always there for all different types of viruses, and depending on how immunosuppressed uh, the individual is, they may not show a, a great immune response. Uh, for some viruses, you'll see viral cytopathic effects, um, whether it's multinucleation, viral inclusions, uh, but for a lot of cases, you won't. Uh, there are some commercially available, widely available antibodies that you all um, are familiar with, like HSV, VZV, CMV, adenovirus. Uh, but then there's many, many other viruses uh, where it's not practical for every uh, laboratory to validate them. Uh, and that's where reference laboratories can be very helpful. The CDC has everything under the, the kitchen sink, everything including the kitchen sink. I'm getting delirious here. Um, and uh, they, they can be very helpful, especially if you can narrow down the differential with a good clinical history. Um, so if you still don't have a result and you've done all of the testing available to you in your lab, you can consider uh, broad spectrum molecular testing um, like metagenomic sequencing, uh, which we'll get to in a second. And the reason that that is the sort of the best test if you don't know what you're looking for is because viruses are so diverse in their genomes that there isn't uh, a universal target like there is for bacteria and fungi. Um, just because viruses may uh, utilize the host cellular machinery, they don't have to have their own ribosomes, and there's no conserved genes across the, the scope of RNA and DNA viruses. Uh, so if you're not familiar with next generation sequencing for metagenomics, um, it is a very powerful tool uh, that basically you, you can do RNA or DNA sequencing of everything in a sample, and then bioinformatically remove all the human reads and try to interpret whatever is left. Um, there are many advantages. It's a single test. It's uh, theoretically unbiased and can detect anything. Um, and it has a moderate turnaround time. It can be as quickly as a couple of days if you have a good pipeline set up, and it can be much longer um, if, if you don't. Um, the limitations are it's relatively expensive. It's a couple thousand dollars. Uh, but for a patient in the neuro ICU, that's the, I wouldn't say that's that uh, much of an investment in getting an answer. Um, and, but there is a potential for false positives. Um, there's incidental reactivation of viruses like EBV and CMV and HHV6 and 7, so you would have to actually uh, interpret things appropriately in context. Uh, so I, I couldn't resist throwing a little bit of my own uh, research in here. Um, one of the ways that we've been trying to better screen cases uh, prior to spending all the money on metagenomics is to come up with universal screens. And one thing that we tried uh, with my collaborator, N.P. Antidosi at Emory, uh, is to look at double-stranded RNA as a broad-spectrum uh, immunostain. Uh, and you can see it works really well uh, for certain things like Powassan virus, which we see a lot of in the Northeast, uh, West Nile virus, another uh, flavivirus. Uh, it actually works really well for rabies. Um, it also works for JC poliomavirus, which is a DNA virus, which is interesting. Works for adenovirus, which is another DNA virus. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't seem to work well for Eastern equine, which is another thing that we see a lot of uh, in the Northeast and don't have uh, widely available stands for. Uh, so we're working on some other alternatives, but just to show that there are efforts out there to um, improve your screening of cases before committing to sequencing.
Uh, and then we're in the home stretch here. We've got case number six, which is a 49-year-old uh, with a, no significant history other than her yearly visits to the, the DR. Uh, she presented with double vision, facial twitching, uh, upper extremity weakness, and was found to have this nodule uh, on a CT, and that was confirmed by MRI as a 1.5 centimeter ring enhancing mass. Uh, so when, we, when this was resected, it was basically a well-encapsulated nodule with reactive brain around it uh, that was cystic in the middle and had various strands of uh, non-human appearing tissue. So if, if our residents can get that far, we're, we're thrilled. Um, and if you've ha ever had a case of cystocercosis, um, it, 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 it always looks like the textbook. So even if you don't know what it is, if you can picture match, you can usually get to the answer. Uh, and then one more case. Um, a 25-year-old woman presented the ED following her first seizure. She actually worked uh, in the area, so her, her coworkers made her go to the ED even though she didn't want to. Um, she had previously spent a summer studying abroad in college in Ghana um, and had this weird nodularity, uh, multifocal and uh, hyperintense lesion um, in her temporal lobe. Uh, which was biopsied, and we saw multiple areas of necrotizing granulomas. And in the middle of those, we saw these non-human looking structures, uh, which had a refractile edge and weird tiny nuclei that didn't look human. Uh, and this was uh, neuroschistosomiasis, and based on her travel history, we thought it was uh, most likely to be uh, Mansoni. Uh, we didn't need serology in this case, but um, it was ordered anyway, and it was, it was positive for uh, schistosoma. And then our approach to parasitic infections, again, uh, is to look at the inflammatory pattern. If you see granulomatous inflammation, EOs, you need to be thinking parasites. If you don't see anything, do lots of levels because they might show up eventually. Um, and this is all morphologic diagnoses. You want to look at, uh, and you want to look at the organism, see if you have a protozoan or a helminth, and whether it's eggs, larvae, adults, and um, go from there with the diagnostic features. Uh, there's IHC available for a few things, like toxoplasma is probably the one people are most uh, familiar with. Uh, but there are other immunostains you can use for amoebas. Um, this is an area where it's really helpful to have uh, experts to, to consult with. So if you don't have so, uh, anyone at your own institution, the CDC has a service called the DPDX, uh, and they'll usually just look at uh, scanned images for you and get you um, some, I, some thoughts uh, within the same day or later. Um, this is just a table from Dr. Gerolomi and uh, Dr. Anthony's book um, telling the, the parasites you're most likely to see in the CNS. And then this is the overall summary, which I've stated over and over. You have to look at the clinical history and get all the diagnostic clues you can from that and your inflammatory pattern. Do your stains, integrate with your molecular results and your culture results, and consult uh, colleagues when you need to. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to find me afterwards, uh, unless we have time now. Um. <laughs> we probably have we probably have time for one question, but uh, we do need to stay on track. So if anyone has a burning question mark. So, so can you comment on the utility of this approach for suspected in utero infections? The, the torch screen used by neo, uh, you know, obstetricians is fairly narrow. So there are things like influenza and mumps that can directly attack a pendamen, at least theoretically can cause congenital hydrocephalus. But once the active infection has subsided, you don't really have any inflammation. So are these, uh, any of these methods good for detecting uh, more or less resolved infections from uh, in utero tissue? So the, the one major weakness of metagenomics is that if you don't have nucleic acids, you can't detect it. So uh, in these cases, um, your next best bet is to look for sort of residual antigen. Um, and if you have a really wide differential, uh, it, it's hard to know sort of what to go after. Uh, I think unbiased proteomics approaches are probably the next best thing, and that's not really been well developed yet, but it's something we're certainly interested in doing. Uh, 
um, is trying to build up databases of uh, viral proteins and figuring out what fragments we can detect. Um, and you can, there's ways to do that that are spatially resolved. Um, but if you don't have an inflammatory pattern that's already made you think about infection, um, I, I, I don't look at enough perinatal brains to know um, what would tip you off if you weren't, if that wasn't already in the clinical differential and there's also no histology to suspect it. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks, Amelia and Isaac.